worship should set his love upon the sons of men. That could have been written for John, couldn't it? This, this man who, every time he needed in the record to refer to himself, said, the disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom, whom Jesus loved. What a, what a wonderful understanding he had of the personal relationship that we have with Jesus. And we have. Every individual one of us is important to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you read through the Gospel record of John, you're constantly reminded of that. He isn't saying, They love me! No. He couldn't believe it. And yet for joy, he did. He did. The disciple whom Jesus loved. The second miracle in Cana of Galilee. It's interesting that Jesus went back there for the second miracle. There, there where the representation of the kingdom coming and the marriage supper of the Lamb being there and the provision of the, the wine and the Lord drinking wine with his disciples as he promised that he will. And he went back there. And it was the Gentile who benefited that time. There, there was the Gentile who was dying on the very point of death and his father comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, please come my son's dying unless you come unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes it's death there's nothing if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't come there's death he said Lord please come Jesus said you know I, I don't actually need to be there you go home, your son's alive. And, and this is the important bit, isn't it? The man believed the word that Jesus spake. That would have took some doing, wouldn't it? To believe the word that Jesus spake. Look, I'm not coming. Go home. You're better now. And he checked, didn't he? He checked. And at the, the very hour that Jesus spake, that young man started to recover. How confident are we in what the Lord is doing for us? We who were at the point of death and we've entered into the waters of baptism and we've come out and we've set ourselves on that wilderness journey to the kingdom uh, with our hands in the hand of the, hand, the man from Galilee. Our hands there. How, how believing are we? There were those who said, Lord, I, I, I do believe, but thankfully the Lord Jesus Christ had compassion on them. And, and, and I think that John, there's different aspects with all the Gospels, isn't there? John somehow is he, he, setting before us the wonder of this man who has the power to bring us from the grave. I think there are only four resurrections in the whole of the Gospel records, aren't there? And, and they're all different. Um, Jairus' daughter, he left it too late, haven't he? He left it too late. Ruler of the synagogue, how could he possibly go to Jesus? Whatever would his colleagues say. Jesus, they didn't want Jesus. And he had to, I've got to go to him, my last hope, but he left it too late. And then, and then, then after that delay, that the servants come from the house and they say, um, "Don't bother the master anymore. She's dead. And the Lord doesn't. Not, a, not a second. Not one second for the man to even think about it. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm coming. It's gonna be all right. And it was. And, and she'd only been dead that that short time." And then in Luke 7, the, 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 that poor woman with the, the lad in the coffin on his way to the grave, he probably died that very morning or maybe the night before. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes up and does something he but well, he's already proved he doesn't need to do. He touches the coffin. Ah. Oh. Touches the coffin. And, and that young man gets up and he's suddenly the Elijah prophet, isn't he? With the young, the young child delivered back to the mother. Touch the coffin, eh? 
Wouldn't he have been unclean? No. You know, with when you when when you read Haggai and God says if such and such and such brushes against this and touches that, will it be unclean? Well, yes, 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 it will be unclean. There's an exception. In Leviticus 6, we're not going there, but there's an exception. And it's the sin offering. It's the sin offering. And when something touches the sin offering, it, it isn't the sin offering that's defiled, it's the something that is made clean. You read the end of Leviticus 6, or read through the several last verses of Leviticus 6. And here's Jesus, totally, totally not needing to touch that coffin, just that he totally didn't need to touch the leper in Luke 5. Touching the coffin. And he's saying, I'm the sin offering, and this is what happens. Eternal life is centred in the sin offering, and it's me. <coughs> These Jews who knew their Bible would have known what we call Leviticus 6. They? They, they would have known it. They didn't call it Leviticus 6. But they would have known it. It's lovely. The, the, the stories are there, aren't they? And, and then you get Lazarus, four days dead, Lord. Well, you know what it says, by now he's thinking. Lord, if only you'd been here a bit earlier. Poor Mary, poor Martha. They, they had such faith. And yet, as we were saying a few minutes ago, faith somehow sometimes doesn't always quite go all the way. And Jesus knows that. Just believe me, he said. It doesn't matter how long he's been dead. I'm the resurrection and the life. It's me. It doesn't matter about how long, how many hours or days or years he's been dead. It doesn't matter. I'm the resurrection. How can it make any difference? And, and he called him out of the grave and he came. And then the fourth one, of course, is his own resurrection. And they're all giving different lessons about the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, there it was, you see, in, in, in the second miracle that John deals with in Cain of Galilee. And he expects us to put the two together, the kingdom, the provision of the wine, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in coming and doing exactly what he said he would do, and sharing the wine with the disciples, uh, and eating and drinking and eating with us, and with the Gentiles who were at the point of death, uh, and we're going to be all right. We are all right. Because the Lord Jesus said, even in my absence, it doesn't matter. You're all right. You're better from that hour when you embraced my word and believed it. You, you're all right. You showed me in the waters of baptism. And so we come to, to John 6. After these things, verse 1 says, Jesus, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him. They were all unprepared, were they? They food with them, we know that. <coughs> Jesus went up into a mountain and sat with his disciples, and, and the Passover was nine. I'm not following this through now, but you might like to. It, amazing how things happen around the Passover time in the Gospel records. But verse 5 says, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company, he said, When shall we buy bread that these made? And this he said to prove Philip. He knew what he would do. Why are we getting involved with proving someone over the provision of bread when there wasn't any? Of course, you know, don't you, that... Um, it, it, it's all about Deuteronomy 8. Uh, you might like to keep your finger here a minute and just have a look. Jesus, in the latter part of the chapter, in intricate detail, takes us back to the wilderness, doesn't he? Um, and the provision of bread. But this is the link here. Deuteronomy 8, verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in, and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thy heart. Here it is. The Lord could have done it differently. He could have removed all their worries at a, in a moment. He could have showered bread from the moment they left Egypt. He could have had every rock pouring forth water, but he wasn't going to do it. 
He's proving them. Proving them. And humbling them. Would they or would they not depend on their God? To what extent would they worry? And, and, and we're no different, are we, from this, this nation here, so far as that is concerned. God has called us, set us on a wilderness journey, promised us the land. And, and he could do so much, he does do so much for us. But we sometimes, in our prayers, we were discussing this with our Bible class, strangely, we sometimes really pray for Lord why didn't you do it differently or could you not just arrange these things in my life differently they're worrying me so much Could, couldn't it be different and, and God God knows what we need before ever he grants it to us before ever we ask for it but he would like us to ask for what he, know, he wants in our lives he'd like us to ask he wants us to be on the same wavelength doesn't he and then it says in verse 3 of Deuteronomy 8, He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. So he let them get hungry before he gave them the manna. He let them, as it were, perceive that they had a need for something that he could provide it before he gave it to them. They had to need it. They had to know their need. And then he would provide it. And you can take that through New Testament promises, can't you? Uh, and he said, you didn't know about the manna, nor your fathers. And he did it, verse 3, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Uh, you've got to learn your priorities, nation. You've got to learn your priorities. You've got to put this first, and if this is first, you will have the confidence that I will provide what you need. Not necessarily what you want, but I will provide what you need. Isn't that lovely? Because that's what God's saying. Um, we're back in John. John chapter 6 again. Philip hasn't got much of an answer, and frankly, I don't think I would have had either. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take even a little. And then one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says, there's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two fishes. You know, if, if, if ever there's someone here with faith, it's this lad. He came prepared, didn't he? He came to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, to go into the desert place with the Lord Jesus Christ. He came prepared. And he was the only one who did. And what's more, when he began to see what the situation was, and crowds can get pretty ugly in circumstances like this, he didn't hide everything away or sneak off home early and stop behind the first rock and have his tea. He didn't do any of those things. He said to Andrew, ask the Lord if this would be any use to him, if this would help. I like this lad. And Jesus, verse 10, Jesus says, make the men sit down. A lot of grass in the place and we, we get the, you know, the spring or whatever out of that. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Uh, he sat them all down and he could have had a, a long line, couldn't he? And just, you know, the sort of thing. Now, I did it at lunchtime in a motorway service centre. You queue up and you, somebody puts on your plate, somebody puts on your plate, somebody puts that. Plate. Would have been quicker, wouldn't it, really? Sit them all down in rows of 50, then he passes it to the disciples, and the, pass, the disciples pass it to them. Why did he do it that way round? Because that which he provides, which is the bread of life, it's all explained later in the chapter, isn't it? Is going to be spread abroad by the disciples. They're the ones chosen for the work. There's a lot of it in Acts. They're the one. He's showing us the way he's going to do it. The manna was the word of life, wasn't it? The manna should have told Israel about the word of life. And here Jesus is providing the bread of life. Again, he's going on to say, me represents me. And the disciples are the ones chosen through whom that bread of life is going to be spread amongst the very nations themselves. And uh, then comes the, the next amazing bit, you see. I should have asked you to keep the Exodus text ready, but verse 12, John, when they were 
filled, so there was enough for everyone, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Ah, it's all completely different, isn't it? This, this is different bread. The bread, that, the bread that Jesus provides, which he likens later in the chapter to the bread of life, that which they ate in the wilderness, well, they're dead, those people, but, but, but that, those who eat my bread will live forever. And, and my bread's me, he says, as you go down past verse 50. Those who take the bread of life into themselves, eternal life is involved in that provision. But um, in Exodus, it's all different, isn't it? In Exodus, well, we ought to go there if you don't mind. In Exodus 16, because the contrast is so great. Verse 18, he's nothing actually to do with it, but verse 19 is, I'm still going to read verse 18, because Paul picks this up. When they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul picks that beautifully and says, that's Jesus Christ's provision for us. Never too much, never too little, always enough, he knows exactly what we need. Okay? And then Moses said in verse 19, let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto Moses, the sort of nation they were, sadly. Some of them left of it until the morning, and he bred worms and stank, and Moses was rough with them. And then they gathered it every morning, every morning, except Saturday morning, the Sabbath. And God had given them enough for the Sabbath. That was the day of rest. But, but you see what I'm saying? Here we have manna provided in the wilderness, and it, 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 it goes off, doesn't it? It doesn't last. It has to continually be renewed. God provides it. It fulfills their need. But God has to say, we're going to do greater things than this in the future. This is just speaking of greater things. And so when Jesus provides this, keep, keep Exodus for a moment, when Jesus provides this, he makes this great big point of having this huge quantity left over and taken that others might benefit from the bread of life too. This doesn't go off. And I, I like the twelve, perhaps looking too strongly at that, I don't know. Twelve baskets full of fragments. Twelve disciples handing the bread of life to the multitude. And Jesus, you know, all the rest of the chapter, if you go into it, the end of the chapter, when he talks about the importance of the bread of life, the life he did to himself, it really is all to do with what comes in Exodus 16 um, in verse 32. Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations. So there was some that wasn't going to go off. Right? that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot, put an omer full of manna therein, lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. To be kept. So that which was of bread which didn't last forever was put in the Ark of the Testimony when it was built. Hebrews reminds us it was actually there. It really was there. It was put in the Testimony. And it lived. And it was put in the Ark of the Testimony along with the, the commandments of the Lord and the rod. Rod is the word. Thank you, Don. That came to life again. It came to life again. It but it's all about resurrection and eternal life and never going. And God walks, as it were, in the midst of that nation through the wilderness with all that evidence and all that proof and they still couldn't take it on board, could they? They couldn't. Some did, but not many. And we have this same wondrous provision 
in Jesus. All these things represented Jesus. He is the life that is now forever. He, he is the, the rod that came forth and, uh, and blossomed and budded and came to life again when it was dead. He is the Lord of the Testament. He is all these things. You can't have it better. God has done all this for us. It's amazing, but it's true. You know, I, I'm going sideways again here at the moment, but just, just perhaps it's coming to your minds too. The rod, Aaron's rod that budded. When Moses, for the second time, smacked that rock with it, when God had said, talk to it, it was the resurrected rod, wasn't it? It was the resurrected rod. <coughs> you can see why God was so angry with him. It's the resurrected rod that he dared to do that with. Never mind. God is a forgiving God and Moses will inherit his land. He will. But he's got to wait. That he without us should not be made perfect. You see? Alright, just one more, one more experience from the record of John, if we may, in chapter 6. We'll, we'll just, just come now to verse 16. Um, when the even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea, entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum, now dark, and Jesus Jesus was not come. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind and blew. So, so when they rode about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said, It is I, be not afraid. And they willingly received him into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Um, this is just one record out of three of, of, of this event. They all, they all actually tell us different little aspects of what was going on here. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ coming near to the ship, casting out their fear, that tossing on the wave. But the fishermen remember that they were still terrified of the waves. It was so bad. And Jesus sort of climbs into the boat and everything's fine. Let's go back to um, Matthew. See what Matthew says about it. Um, it's chapter 6, isn't it? I have noticed that one. I'm pretty sure it's Matthew 6. <laughs> no, it's not. 14. 14. Okay. I'll tell you what, go to Mark 8. <laughs> I know it's there. Mm, I've completely lost it, man. That's good, isn't it? So it's Matthew 14, 22, if you want it. Okay. Let me go there. Thank you. Yeah, but we'll, this, this will do us very well. Thank you, Don. Um, straightway, Jesus, it's 14, 22. Straightway. Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was in the midst of the sea. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But Jesus says, be of good cheer, it's I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. He said, come then. <laughs> and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. Do you think we're like that too? Do you think that the times when we, we join on know whatever Jesus says he can do for us, he can. And we, we set out, as it were, to meet him after it. We, we, we're going to take advantage of it. We're going to do it. And then all these things that are going on in our lives sort of detract us. And we begin to see.
sink into them. Uh, and we've got to watch out for Jesus saying, I want to get you out of these things. Come on. Oh, why did you doubt? Oh, you have little faith. Uh, one more attempt to find the other one. Mark 6, isn't it? I said Matthew 6. That's where I think I went wrong. Because there's a third thing, you see. There's a, it is. Mark 6. <laughs> Verse 45. We've got Peter is with the Matthew record. We've got a very short account of it in the John record. And we've got an extra thing here. Again. Verse 45. Mark 6. Straight away he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. When he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, so it, it's all happening in the dark. Follow that through if you like. It's all happening in the dark. And when it's the darkest hour, Jesus comes. And he saw them toiling and rowing. The wind was contrary. Fourth watch of the night, he comes to them walking on the sea. And would have passed by them. Now, wait a minute. Would have passed by them. Now, you wait for me to answer that. I'm not sure any of us can. If it's literally as it is in the AV and one or two of the other versions, that Jesus looks at them in the boat, troubled, and goes on by, it's difficult to understand, except perhaps to say, well, maybe he wants them to know their need and to cry out. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's fine. Maybe that's it. And then we've got the what we've already read. When they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed to be in a spirit and cried out. And they all saw him and troubled. We don't get Peter's event here, but he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer, it's I. He went up unto them in the ship, and the wind ceased. That's an addition, isn't it? The wind ceased. They were so amazed at themselves beyond measure and wonder. You know, living by the sea, and you're not all that far away from it, are you? Living by the sea, I, I well remember a very, very stormy stormy couple of days when the waves were very high indeed and we were due to sail um, in the wave piercing sea cap to Jersey to visit the Ecclesia there and um, the storm had stopped, wind had dropped, I'll tell you what, nobody had told the sea, wave piercer, nobody had told the boat either, roll, roll, roll all the way across. The wind stopped and this put it all together and the sea was calm. That which was troubling the sea stopped and the sea wasn't troubled anymore. It's like that with us. Jesus can take away that which troubles us and he can deal with the effect immediately. Nature doesn't matter with Jesus. He does it his way. And he does do it. He's with us day by day. Now, one more, then that's, that's it. One more from this. Have you ever wondered where else you see this reference to passing by? I'll tell you. Moses, Moses, who had met the Lord, or the angel of his presence as it would have been, face to face, even eating with him, drinking with him, God then says, you want to see my glory? Well, you can't yet. You can't yet. So I'll put you in a rock, and I'll cover you, and my glory will pass by. I wonder if they were supposed to pick that up from the art, or if we are from the text, that the glory of God can pass us by. If only we will see it, it's there. And that which happened on that occasion was a proclamation of all that's summed up in Jesus Christ. Isn't it? Yahweh, Yahweh, El, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, that were by no means clear the guilty. This, this is what was proclaimed. This is the glory of the Lord proclaimed. And it happened again with Elijah. Did Elijah knew the rules, didn't he? He went to Horeb, depressed, <coughs> seeking encouragement from God, and when he realised that there was a still small voice, he covered his face, just as Moses had, 
covered his face and went out uh, and the glory of God had passed by is it that we're supposed to take the Moses and Elijah lessons from this to, to see the fulfilment of all their work in the Lord Jesus Christ I think that we probably are and uh, I may confuse you completely here it's a terrible place to leave you with confusion isn't it but I just find it interesting just interesting that in the, all Hebrew letters have a numerical value you don't actually have separate figures in Hebrew they've all got numerical value so you can add up words well Moses adds up to 345 Elijah adds up to 52 that's 297 Jeshua, Hebrew for Jesus, adds up to, you've got it, 397. Now, isn't that lovely? Moses and Elijah add up to Jesus. And here we've got this reference to the glory of God passing by. And as a result of the glory of God passing by, the disciples are cheered, the storm is made still, the boat is safe. And that's where we are, isn't it? And I think that um, in a few moments the final hymn that I've asked that we should sing together and um, we share some experience of the writing of this hymn with Brother Ted Burt and uh, Brother Ian Heidemann. It, it was in 1999 that um, Val and I went to the All Ireland Conference with Brother Ted Burt and he and I spoke for a few days on the theme, The Hope of Glory, Christ in You. Brother Ted said, I hope you don't mind, but I've written a hymn, and Brother Ian has written some music, and um, I'd like us to learn it through the, through the conference, and we'll sing it as the last hymn, and we'll really know it by then, because it keeps on saying, doesn't it, the hope of glory, Christ in us, John knew all about the hope of glory, Christ in us, and um, we, we, we learn it, and on the last day, um, I played it, and he, he conducted it, and we blew the roof off. I want to do that again today. <laughs> and it became, I don't see Australian conference hymn, you say? Yes, but lovely. And um, everybody knows who's presiding or speaking when they walk in Winton Hall and 380 is on the board, because I always have it. <laughs> but it happens to be exceedingly appropriate today. So, in a few minutes, let's give it all we got, with the understanding it was written by brethren who 